Hi, Andre here from the MSAG team. This video in our interview series covers one of the core pillars of medical ethics, autonomy, which is the patient's right to self-governance. If you're not familiar with autonomy, you will be after this video. Timestamps in the description below. Let's get started. If I was to tell you that my sister will die unless she receives a blood transfusion, and that you are the only compatible donor on earth, would you help? It is likely that the kind heart in you would choose to help her by going through a relatively minor, easy and safe procedure of blood donation. Let's assume now that you and I are sworn enemies and even though donating blood is the only way to save my sister's life, you refuse to do so. Could I force you to give blood to save her life? Does the fact that a life is at stake make this acceptable? We will discuss the ethical and legal definitions of autonomy. We'll also look at where the idea of autonomy in medical practice came from. Finally, we will talk through examples of when autonomy should be respected. Examples where it may be void and a famous legal case that informs practice even today. Our opening scenario shows how important the principle of autonomy is in modern medicine and how important it is that a person has complete control over their own body. Autonomy includes the cultural, ethical and legal reasons why I would not be able to force you to donate that blood to my sister, even for the purpose of saving another life. But it was not always like that. The word autonomy comes from the Greek words autos, meaning self, and nomos, meaning rule. Autonomy initially referred to the self-rule of independent cities and has since been extended to mean individual self-governance. This latter definition encompasses the liberty, privacy and freedom of choice of the individual. And in relation to medicine, autonomy means giving competent adults the right to make decisions about their own medical treatment. Patient autonomy is probably the biggest topic in medical ethics. Having respect for decisions made by competent adult patients is a crucial cornerstone of medical law. Let's take a look at how things used to be. In the past, if you were a doctor, you didn't have to provide patients with information about their prognosis or the advantages and disadvantages of different treatments. It was assumed that you would decide the best course of action for your patient. This means that when my great, great, great grandmother called the doctor for her stomach pain, even if the doctor thought my relative had a severe infection, it was considered acceptable to not tell her and give her some syrup to try. To give you an example of how ingrained this attitude was in the medical profession, historically, we need to look no further than Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. He said, perform your duties calmly and adroitly, concealing most things from the patient while you are attending to him, turning his attention away from what is being done to him, revealing nothing of the patient's future or present condition. The Hippocratic Oath itself assumes that treatment decisions are for the doctor alone. I swear by Apollo and Esculapes that I will follow the system of regimen, which according to my ability and judgment, I consider for the benefit of my patients. Although this was commonly accepted by the medical profession and the public in days gone by, this paternalistic attitude is now considered outdated as it is seen to alienate your patients from being active participants in their own care. Now, before we look at how autonomy is applied in practice of modern medicine, let's remind ourselves that doctors of the past were not bad people. For the majority, at least, they didn't lie to their patients out of malice. Until relatively recently, it was thought that informing patients about a poor prognosis, possible side effects, or the availability of alternative treatments would be likely to cause distress and confusion. On the other hand, can you see how keeping patients in ignorance and maintaining their trust and hope through the illusion of medical certainty could be considered beneficial? Many diseases were not fully understood and many common treatments such as bloodletting were in fact very ineffective. If your patient was going to improve, it was most likely as a result of the placebo effect and in turn, this allowed the illusion of the all-knowing doctor to act as a therapy on its own. This is very different to what we know in the 21st century. So when did this attitude begin to change? 
1767, there was a very famous case which was a turning point in the legal recognition of the right to autonomy in the practice of medicine. Slater versus Baker and Stapleton. Slater, the patient, had broken his leg and it hadn't healed well, so he sought treatment from another physician, a surgeon named Baker and an apothecary, Stapleton. They re-broke his leg and set it in a heavy steel thing that had teeth to stretch it with very poor results. The jury awarded Slater 500 pounds, which is approximately 60,000 pounds in today's currency. The court said that it is reasonable that a patient should be told what it is about to be done to him, so that he may take courage and place himself in such a situation as to enable him to undergo the operation. Patients didn't then have an autonomy-based right to be provided with information yet, but the change had started, and the seed of what we now know as informed consent had been planted. If I tell you that as a doctor, you will have a duty to offer patients information and choice regarding their medical care, would you agree or disagree? It wasn't until the 20th century that this idea that doctors might have a duty to offer patients information and choice began to take hold. It became a question about human rights, the right to decide what is done onto our own bodies. As Michael Jones, professor of law at the University of Liverpool explained, a patient with no rights is a citizen who is stripped of his or her individuality and autonomy as well as her clothes as soon as she walks into the surgery or the hospital. In the last few years, there have also been many new discoveries in medicine which would make a paternalistic approach to treating patients even less appropriate. As a doctor in an outpatient NHS clinic, I almost always have at least two treatment options to offer my patients for a given condition, if not more. Although my training and experience qualifies me to diagnose and offer solutions to patients, it doesn't qualify me to decide on the side effects or possible risks that the patient would find acceptable to proceed with. For example, in cardiology outpatients, when I see a patient with an irregular heartbeat, I may be able to offer them the option of medication for life or a procedural intervention. One patient may prefer lifelong medication over the increased risk of an intervention, but another may be willing to take that increased risk in order to reduce the hassle of having to take daily medications. Patient autonomy allows both patients to choose a treatment that they feel is in their best interest. You may think that this is obvious, which option a patient would choose, but in reality, every person is different. Many factors can influence a patient, including religious beliefs, other health conditions, family and friends' opinions. When practicing medicine and while answering your medical school interview questions, do not assume that patients will want what seems like the reasonable option to you. So now that you understand how recent the concept of autonomy is, let's move on to define autonomy in medicine for the purpose of your medical school interview preparation. In medical practice, autonomy is usually expressed as the right of a competent adult to make an informed decision about their own medical care. A competent adult is one who can demonstrate that they understand the information about the treatment decisions, are able to weigh up the pros and cons of each option, and can communicate their decision to their medical team. This is known as capacity. The principle of autonomy underlies the requirement to seek the consent or informed agreement of the patient before any investigation or treatment takes place. The principle is perhaps seen at its most forcible when patients exercise their autonomy by refusing life-sustaining treatment. However, these are not the most common scenarios you will see in practice. An example that comes to my mind was that of a young patient I remember from the ward from my first year as a junior doctor. She had a long history of drug abuse and self-harm. Despite this, she was deemed to be a competent adult and as a result, myself and the team were compelled to respect her decision when she refused to stay in hospital for emergency investigations of what could have been a stomach bleed. 
There may be circumstances that you come across in your career in medicine where a patient has exercised their right to autonomy before the fact. The classic medical school interview example of this is a Jehovah's Witness patient who is brought into A&E unconscious and requires a blood transfusion. In this situation, the patient may have created a legal document before the episode, making their views regarding a specific decision clear in the event that they are unable to give consent at that time. This is known as an advanced directive, and in this case of the Jehovah's Witness, there may be a directive refusing blood on religious grounds. So far, we've looked at fairly straightforward examples where autonomy is clearly the primary ethical pillar. But what about a patient suffering from anorexia? Should they be forcibly fed? After all, we've already seen that a competent adult can refuse medical treatment, even if it will result in their death. Why then should an adult woman of ordinary intelligence not have a decision to refuse nutrition respected? The justification is usually that the anorexia has undermined her ability to make an autonomous decision. The decision to refuse food, it is said, is not hers, but springs from a misperception caused by her mental health condition. As well as the delusion of needing to lose weight, the person's mind could be altered by the lack of nutrition. Force feeding could be described as a paternalistic in intervention designed to help her reach a state where she is able to make an autonomous decision. Here, we are making the case that pillars of beneficence and non-maleficence outweigh the pillar of autonomy. Before we finish, let's take a look at the modern interpretations of the law regarding autonomy. In 1993, a famous case made the legal standpoint when it comes to autonomy very clear. In this case, T was a 20-year-old woman who had been injured in a car accident when she was 34 weeks pregnant. During her admission, she refused a blood transfusion on religious grounds and refused to sign a consent form. Shortly afterwards, she underwent an emergency caesarean section and sadly, her baby was still born. She herself deteriorated rapidly and was transferred to the intensive care unit in an unconscious state. The anaesthetist hesitated to transfuse her given her previous refusal and T's father and brother pleaded that the court intervene. All three judges in the court of appeal were committed to the patient's autonomy. One in particular said, an adult whose mental capacity is unimpaired has the right to decide for herself whether she will or will not receive medical or surgical treatment, even in circumstances where she is likely or even certain to die in the absence of treatment. So, to summarize, we have looked at the origins and case law surrounding autonomy, from Hippocrates to the modern day. We have defined autonomy as the right of competent adults to make informed decisions about their own medical care, and we have considered an illustrative example of a time when the right to autonomy may be superseded by another pillar of medical ethics. At the end of the day, we all should have the right to decide what happens to our own bodies. And just as you or I would find it upsetting to have anything done to us against our will, this is also true of our patients. I ensure that m I consider my patient's autonomy every day on the wards, and I hope this video has helped you to begin to understand its importance in the practice of medicine. We have also given you a brief overview of the necessary information needed to apply the principle to ethical scenarios you may be given at interview. Medical ethics can be complicated, but it is important that you can demonstrate that these pillars must be applied in a case-by-case -case basis, and that no two patients or cases are the same. Thanks for watching. I hope that you feel ready to discuss the right to autonomy in your medical school interviews. To help you practice, we've put an example ethical question in the comments below. Let us know how you would answer, and we'll give you some feedback. If you found this video helpful, please leave a like, and if you want to see more medical school admissions content, then subscribe to our channel. We put out new videos every week. Best of luck on your admissions.